So the last uh, talk of today's afternoon session is on learning quantum states of continuous variable systems. And we have the pleasure to hear from Francesco Mele about this. Thank you very much. Um, this work was possible thanks to the huge effort of this uh, wonderful team of people, Antonio Anna Mele, my twin brother, Leonard Bittel, Jan Seisert, Vittorio Giovannetti, Ludovico Lami, Lorenzo Leone and Salvatore Oliviero. Most of them are also here in this room. Okay. This talk is based uh, on uh, two main topics, the topic of uh, quantum learning theory and the topic of uh, continu continuous variable systems. Quantum learning theory has been extensively developed for finite dimensional systems, but this is not the case for infinite dimensional systems like continuous variable systems. The central problem in uh, quantum learning theory is uh, quantum state tomography. That means learning unknown quantum states. Despite many heuristic tomography methods available uh, in the quantum optics literature, the, the literature lacks rigorous performance guarantees of tomography of continuous variable systems. In particular, a comprehensive analysis of the sample complexity has never been performed for uh, continuous variable systems, for tomography of continuous variable systems. And uh, in this work, we fill this gap. The outline of the talk is as follows. Uh, I start by giving an introduction to quantum state tomography, then uh, talk about uh, uh, continuous variable systems, and then I will talk about uh, our results on uh, tomography of uh, continuous variable systems. So, Quantum state tomography means learning unknown quantum state. You can imagine that uh, you have an experiment, and then uh, when you run this experiment, the output uh, is a quantum system initialized in an unknown quantum state row. And the goal of a tomography algorithm is to uh, learn the state, basically to provide a good approximation of the state. Basically, uh, the tomography algorithm takes in input many copies of your of the unknown state rho and uh, outputs a classical description of uh, a quantum state rho tilde such that it is uh, a good approximation of the true unknown quantum state rho. The output, so rho tilde, approximate rho. Uh, in which sense? Now we precisely define what does it mean that rho tilde uh, is an approximation of rho. Basically, uh, rho tilde has to be uh, close, very close with, uh, to rho with some meaningful notion of distance. And the, the most meaningful notion of distance to distinguish quantum states is the trace distance. This is due to the operational meaning due to the level Elstrom theorem. So what uh, we are requiring is that uh, the trace distance between rho tilde and the rho is very small, is epsilon close, is epsilon small. So, Basically, the trace distance between rho tilde and rho is less than epsilon. And uh, here there is another observation to do. Basically, uh, rho tilde, uh, uh, the output of the tomography argument is a random variable. This is because uh, the outcome of uh, quantum measurement are inherently probabilistic. And so the condition that we have to require is that uh, rho tilde is uh, epsilon close to rho with high probability, with probability that is larger than one minus delta, where delta is a small parameter. Delta is, uh, is called the failure probability, while epsilon is the trace distance error. Okay, and the um, tomography algorithm is designed to learn state in some prior assumption set of uh, states, called uh, uh, denoted as S. In summary, the problem of tomography is as follows. Given n copies of the known state rho in the prior assumption class, set, <laughs> The goal is to output a classical description of state rho tilde such that is uh, epsilon close to rho with high probability. In order to measure the performance of the problem of tomography, one uh, introduces the concept of, of uh, sample complexity. The sample complexity is uh, the minimum number of copies that uh, allows one to achieve tomography. The sample complexity depends on the prior assumption set, on the trace distance error, and on the failure probability delta. 
And uh, so it's just the minimum number of copies to achieve tomography. For example, if you don't have any prior additional information on your state, if you just know that your state is acuted, then the sample complexity uh, of tomography of QDIT is given by this formula. Um, from the rest of the talk, I will just forget about the dependence of the fair probability because it's always logarithmic like that. So from now on, just delete the dependence on delta. And uh, the sample complexity is just d square over epsilon square. If you have the additional information that the, the unknown state is pure, then the sample complexity reduces to d over epsilon square. Okay, the, um, what is important uh, here, and uh, I uh, want you to remember for the rest of the talk, is that uh, the dependence with respect to the trace distance error here, it's always like one over epsilon square. This will be important uh, later. And uh, okay, uh, moreover, for n qubit states, the dimension is uh, two to the power of n, and so the sample complexity scales exponentially in the number of qubits. It scales exponentially in the system size. And uh, when uh, the sample complexity does not scale polynomially, we say that uh, this task is uh, inefficient. So tomography is inefficient. Okay, let's talk about continuous variable systems. We are basically talking about quantum optical systems. Um, here, the role of one qubit is played by the so-called one mode. One mode uh, is basically one qubit with d with uh, d equal to infinite. One mode is basically an infinite dimensional qubit. The Hilbert space of one mode is the span of uh, cat zero, cat one, cat d, and so on and so forth. Cat, uh, these are called the Fox states. Cat zero is the vacuum state. Cat one is the single photon state. And cat D is the state with D photons. By definition, a continuous variable, uh, a continuous variable systems, oh, sorry, continuous variable system is a, a system that consists in N modes. It is uh, N uh, qubits with D equal to infinite. Okay, now let's talk about our results. So uh, strictly speaking, without any additional prior assumption on your unknown state, uh, tomography of continuous variable systems is impossible. This is just because the dimension is infinite and the sample complexity is uh, infinite. However, uh, in, for any practical purpose, you always have an additional prior information on the energy of your state. For example, you always know that uh, uh, the energy of the light source that you have in lab is uh, upper bounded by the energy of the sun, or maybe the, by the energy budget that you have in the laboratory. So uh, the crucial observation is that uh, in lab, continuous variable systems have bounded the energy. Uh, okay, let's formalize uh, this uh, concept. Uh, we have uh, the energy observable, also called the total photon number, defined uh, as follows. It acts uh, on uh, the tensor product of n uh, Fox states uh, as this, by counting the total number of photons. And uh, uh, the assumption that uh, we are requiring on the unknown state row is that uh, it satisfies an energy constraint. So it uh, the assumption is that uh, the unknown state row satisfies that uh, the expectation value of the energy observable is upper bounded by uh, a known parameter, e tot. This known parameter uh, has, to, uh, is, uh, has to be understood as, uh, the, for example, the energy of the sun or the energy budget available uh, in the laboratory. Okay, so uh, since we are interested in the scaling uh, with the system sides, with, with the number of modes, and since uh, the total energy is an extensive uh, quantity, and we don't want implicit dependence on the number of modes. And we just uh, redefine the total energy by, uh, by putting a NAN here in order to don't have implicit dependence on the number of modes. And uh, so now it's, this is just a redefinition, a redefinition. It's not uh, really important. Now E represents the energy per mode and it is a known parameter. Okay, so 
uh, our first main results uh, regards the sample complexity of tomography of the energy constraint states, pure states. Uh, we find this uh, sample complexity, and it is given by this formula. Uh, so this number of copies of the state is not only sufficient, but also necessary to achieve tomography. And this result is uh, quite informative uh, because it tells us that uh, the sample complexity does not only scale exponentially in the number of modes as in the finite dimensional setting, but it uh, also uh, exhibits this uh, very bad uh, scaling with the trace distance error, which uh, uh, in, while in the finite dimensional setting, the, trace dis the behavior with the trace distance error, it's, it's just one over epsilon square. Here in continuous variable systems is one over epsilon to the two n, which is uh, very bad. And um, uh, just to understand why it is bad, uh, consider that uh, if we want to half the trace distance error epsilon, if we want to decrease the trace distance error by a factor of two, in the finite dimensional setting, you just need to increase your number of copies by a factor of four, which is cheap. While uh, in the continuous variable setting, you need to increase your number of copies by a factor four to the power of n, which is extremely inefficient, extremely expensive. This is why we say that uh, uh, continuous variable tomography is uh, extremely inefficient because of this uh, bad scaling with the trace distance error. Let's just uh, make another example to understand uh, um, this inefficiency. Let's consider first the qubit setting. So let's consider uh, tomography. And uh, let's consider that we run the experiment every one nanosecond. And um, uh, let's uh, say that we want to try achieve uh, trace distance error 0 0.1. OK, let's consider tomography of 10 qubit states. It turns out that uh, the total time required to achieve tomography is 0 0.1 millisecond, which is uh, not so much. It's uh, it is achievable. OK, now let's consider the uh, analogous problem in continuous variable systems. Let's consider the problem of uh, tomography of uh, 10 mod state with energy per mod upper bounded by one. This is a fair comparison with 10 qubit states because uh, uh, energy per mod upper bounded by one uh, means that on average you have at most uh, one photon uh, and the other photons are suppressed. Uh, so basically, uh, by applying our sample complexity formula, it turns out that the total time required to achieve continuous variable tomography has to be at least 3,000 years. That shows a huge separation with the qubit setting. OK. Uh, so uh, we have proved that uh, tomography of uh, continuous variable systems in general is uh, extremely inefficient. Um, and this, is, uh, this can be regarded as a no-go result. Now, let's say a positive result. Uh, in uh, many practical situations, uh, you know you have the prior information that your state is Gaussian. Gaussian states are very common in lab and uh, in nature. And uh, here we can show that uh, tomography of uh, Gaussian states uh, is uh, efficient. And uh, OK, now I just tell you the idea of uh, this fact. OK. Um, I will not enter into the definition of Gaussian states. I will just tell you that uh, a Gaussian state, as uh, in the classical probability, in classical probability theory, is uniquely identified by uh, the so-called first moment and covariance matrix of uh, the Gaussian state, of the state, uh, as uh, for Gaussian probability distributions, classical probability distributions. This is also true for ga quantum Gaussian states. OK. Uh, th uh, this is the only fact that we need, that a Gaussian state row is uniquely identified by its first moment and its covariance matrix. Basically, if you specify the first moment, the covariance matrix of a Gaussian state, you also specify the state. And what is important is that uh, these quantities, these moments, can be efficiently measured via the so-called homodyne measurement. And so uh, if you estimate the moments, you also provide an estimate of the state because of this one-to-one uh, -one correspondence. And now a uh, natural question arises. Uh, in practice, you can only have uh, 
epsilon approximation of the moments. And uh, however, uh, we, uh, we, we are interested in the trace distance error on the state because the trace distance is the most meaningful distance uh, uh, to distinguish quantum states due to the O-level Elstrom theorem. So uh, the fundamental question that arises here uh, that we propose is that uh, uh, if we estimate the moments of a non Gaussian state with a certain pre precision epsilon, how this uh, error epsilon propagates into the trace distance on the trace distance error on the state. This is uh, uh, crucial for, uh, to analyze the sample complexity of tomography of Gaussian states. And uh, we answer this question by uh, providing uh, upper and lower bounds uh, on the trace distance between two Gaussian states in terms of the norm distance of their uh, moments. Okay, this is the upper bound. This is the lower bound. It's not really important. And um, we have that trace distance error is at least epsilon and at most square root of epsilon, where uh, epsilon is the error on the moment. Okay. And uh, um, Alexander Olevo uh, got interested in this uh, question. And a few weeks ago, uh, proved uh, a new upper bound uh, on the trace distance between Gaussian states that uh, can outperform our upper bound in some uh, regimes. And uh, take a look uh, to Olevo's new beautiful paper. Uh, OK, uh, by exploiting this uh, new tool, we can uh, uh, perform a sample complexity analysis of tomography of uh, Gaussian states and prove that uh, the sample complexity is polynomial in N uh, in the number of modes. And this proves that tomography of Gaussian states is efficient. Okay, to summarize, uh, we have proved that uh, tomography of uh, arbitrary non-Gaussian states is extremely inefficient. On the opposite side, we have proved that tomography of uh, Gaussian states is uh, efficient. The last part of our work uh, so another question arises. Uh, what is the trade-off between uh, the efficiency in tomography and the degree of non-Gaussianity? Uh, the last part of our work studied this trade-off. Uh, and uh, we studied this trade-off between the efficiency of tomography and uh, non-Gaussianity by uh, studying uh, tomography of T-dopt Gaussian states. T-dopt Gaussian states are uh, states that can be uh, uh, Produced by applying uh, to the vacuum state Gaussian unitaries and uh, at most T single mode non Gaussian gates. Um, so if you start from the vacuum, you can apply Gaussian unity, then uh, a single mode non Gaussian gate, and so on, support for T times. Notice that uh, uh, for T equal to zero, the family of the set of T dot Gaussian states coincides with the set of Gaussian states. Then the set of T dot Gaussian states enlarges as T grows. And then it, uh, um, when t is equal to infinity, it, uh, it becomes the full set of states. So in this sense, by studying the, how the sample complexity behaves with respect to t, we can study how the efficiency of the tomography behaves in terms of the non-Gaussianity. And uh, in order to study this, we introduce a, a, a theorem, a compression theorem, it says that uh, if you apply a suitable non Gaussian, uh, suitable Gaussian unitary to a T dot uh, Gaussian state, you can compress all the non Gaussianity in the first T modes, in the first two T modes. And uh, this is uh, a bosonic generalization of, the, um, of analogous results um, known in the fermionic and the, in the Clifford setting. And uh, this shows uh, an intriguing parallelism between the three theories of bosons, fermions, and Clifford's. Okay, with, with this uh, um, com um, compression theorem at end, we can uh, easily come up with uh, a tomography algorithm for T dot uh, Gaussian states. I will not enter in the, into detail uh, uh, of this algorithm because uh, there is no time, but uh, um, I will just go to the conclusion and say, and say that uh, if T is a constant, then tomography of uh, T dot Gaussian states is efficient. Uh, and the sample complexity scales at most as n to the power of t. So when t is constant, the sample complexity scales polynomial in the number of modes. And uh, so 
tomography of the TDOPT Gaussian states is efficient. So, in conclusion, uh, in our work, we provided the first investigation of tomography of continuous variable systems with uh, rigorous performance guarantees with respect to the trace distance error. Uh, we find the sample complexity for energy constraint pure states, and we showed the phenomenon of extreme inefficiency of uh, continuous variable tomography due to this very bad scaling with the trace distance error. And then uh, we showed a positive result that tomography of Gaussian states is efficient. And then uh, we studied the trade off between the, these uh, two results. I mean, uh, uh, these are two limits results. I mean, uh, we studied the, the trade off between uh, Gaussian states and arbitrary non Gaussian states by studying, uh, so uh, by deriving results on the trade off between efficiency in tomography and uh, degree of non-Gaussianity by studying uh, the sample complexity of tomography of adopt Gaussian states. And uh, last, we introduced the technical tools of uh, independent interest. For example, uh, trace uh, bounds on the trace distance between uh, Gaussian states in terms of the norm distance of their moments. Okay, uh, thank you for the attention. Great, are there any questions? Oh, a lot of them, let's start here. Um, I have a very naive question and apologies for my ignorance about continuous variable systems. But uh, for discrete variable systems, if we don't look at the trace distance, but look at other measures of distance, which are kind of looser, mm -hmm. then I think uh, the bounds are much more favorable. It does not go exponentially in the system size. So could something similar be done for continuous variable systems as well? Yeah, I would expect so. Yeah, but uh, um, I, I think that uh, uh, performing an analysis so, uh, with respect to trace distance is uh, what uh, it makes sense because it has an operational meaning. Uh, uh, what I mean is if these quantities were vectors instead of matrices, we could look at the infinity norm. Mm -hmm. And in the infinity norm can be uh, kind of found out, uh, finding it is much more easier than finding, say, the two norm, which is more uh, mm -hmm. convenient, conventionally used. So other norms could, other distance metrics could also have physical meaning, but could still be uh, easier to find. Mm -hmm. So any thoughts about that? Um, okay, we don't, uh, we don't have uh, analyzed the uh, other other norms, just uh, the trace distance. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, yeah, I had a question about the continuous or energy constrained states. I, I think you said that if the energy is constrained to be about like one, then that's like you have one excitation. Mm -hmm. um, in that case, I would imagine that your tomography is kind of like you're doing a qubit tomography. So then the um, complexity would scale as uh, like a Q, something that the complexity of learning a qubit, but mm -hmm. I think you mentioned that it scales as uh, like um, three thousand, um, yeah. which is very different. So, um, yeah. do you think it should reduce? Like, is that a fair assumption to make that mm -hmm. in, in that limit that you should get something that's close to the qubit case? Or um, yeah, uh, yeah. When uh, I say that uh, the energy per, per mode is upper bounded by one, I just say that uh, the expectation value of the total photon number operator is uh, upper bounded by one. For example, if you take uh, a coherent state as a, is a superposition of all the Fox states, but uh, uh, if the amplitude is uh, sufficiently small, it has a mean photon number, mean energy that is uh, upper bounded by one. So it's not uh, a qubit state, but uh, the um, overlap with the, with the, with the I number Fox states with the focus states with a naive photon number is uh, suppressed. Uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, very small. All right, thank you. Welcome. Okay, one question here. So uh, for Gaussian states, is the energy related to the mean and the variance in some way? And yes. uh, because like classically, like what, what is the intuition for, the, for why Gaussian states can be efficiently uh, uh, can be efficiently learned because, like classically, they they maximize like the entropy for you know 
uh, when the moment and the variances uh, are, are fixed. So okay. just a feeling. Yeah, the intuition is that uh, uh, while uh, when you do, when you do tomography of the non-Gaussian states, you have uh, um, an infinite amount of parameter defining the states, all the coefficients of all the Fox states. In Ga for Gaussian states, you have just to learn a polynomial number of parameters that are those that define the first moments and those that define the covariance matrix. So n uh, parameters, two n parameters for the first moment, and uh, four n square parameters for uh, the covariance matrix. So the number of total of parameters is a polynomial in the number of months. So uh, this is the intuitive reason why you just need the poly n uh, number of copies to learn a Gaussian state, because you have just to measure poly n observables, basically. But uh, the tricky part uh, of our proof uh, uh, lies in uh, how to propagate the error from the moments to the trace distance. That's the first one, the energy related? Ah, see, yes, yes. Uh, the, uh, the energy of a, of a state is uh, given basically by the trace of the covariance matrix uh, plus uh, basically the true norm of the first moment. And uh, maybe the last opportunity for a short question. Short? Very good. Uh, do you think that the uh, dependency on epsilon will still remain if you consider shadow tomography instead of tomography? Okay. Um, yeah, okay. Classical, uh, um, yeah, cl I mean, uh, uh, shadow tomography, not necessarily ah, okay, classical okay. shadow okay, tomography. Okay. I see, I see. Okay, uh, so. I don't know the answer uh, for, uh, okay, actually classical shadow is also an algorithm for shadow tomography. And uh, yeah, okay. So um, it, the answer is uh, uh, no, as, uh, as long as uh, the number of observables that you want to learn, uh, yeah, it's uh, fixed. Yeah, the, and uh, the observables uh, satisfy some uh, suitable conditions. Yeah, the, you have the same results that also in the finite dimensional setting. But if you want to use uh, the, classical shadow algorithm uh, to perform tomography, then uh, yeah, of, uh, as to satisfy these uh, fundamental limits of, on the sample complexity, yes. Great, then let's not only take the opportunity to thank uh, Francesco, Francesco for his thank nice you. talk, but also for, not yet, <laughs> but also the, the support uh, people that have been, uh, that have made it possible to run so smoothly this uh, afternoon session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.